All right. Uh, so last week we talked about um, some of the reasons why as Catholics we should care about evolution, why it's not just a scientific question, why it has uh, repercussions for our faith. Um, and also how important it is that uh, as Catholics we'd be able to defend the truth uh, that God created not just uh, man, but everything. Um, and in the midst of that, we talked about how there's that hierarchy of sciences um, and how the lower sciences re kind of rest upon the higher sciences for the first principles. Um, and we also talked about how uh, some of the principles of evolution, like survival of the fittest, um, and then the fundamental unit of species um, was kind of vague. Um, and so the next two sessions, what we'll do is kind of uh, take a couple of steps up the ladder to try to look and see how evolution is compatible with, um, with the faith. Um, and then also to look at it from a philosophical standpoint. Um, and remember sort of getting at the point where we're trying to get to um, where the higher sort of eliminates, right? And so by the time we get to the actual um, empirical sciences, we begin to see holes in it. Um, and then we know why the holes are there because reality is not the way that they're painting it. Um, and so at, at best I said it was uh, scientifically dubious, uh, it's theologically indefensible um, and metaphysically impossible. And so tonight we'll show why it's, why it's uh, theologically indefensible, okay? All right, so the, um, there's two ways in which God can attack or um, the devil can uh, attack God, right? He can attack, uh, no, it's all good. All right, I think that's good. Um, so he, he can attack uh, God by directly attacking him in the sense of trying to create unbelief um, or to try to ch attack the church directly. I remember we talked about how Darwin had read Voltaire and thought that the indirect method was the best. Um, and so one of the ways that you can then attack belief in God is to um, attack his image, right? And so uh, one way you can attack the image is um, to sort of, um, make it so that, that man is nothing but an accident. Man comes from below instead of from above. Um, and then uh, the other way, which this sort of gets into to what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, so the two most uh, controversial uh, or most talked about encyclicals in the 20th century were Humani Vitae and Humani Generis, right? Both about man and the ways that, that man images God. Uh, Humani Vitae was um, a reiteration of the church's insistence um, that uh, men and women image the Trinity in the family, right? And it was to protect and preserve that was the, the purpose of that, right? And you'll find many people will talk about Humani Vitae who haven't read it, right? Humani Generis, which is uh, Pope Pius XII's encyclical, um, really on the, the philosophical underpinnings of evolution is also um, falls under that category of um, a lot talked about, but not very much read. And, and mostly it will be just a single paragraph that they'll talk about, right? So I'm gonna read that paragraph and then we're gonna talk about what, what, he real, what Pope Pius XII means, okay? Um, he says, the teaching authority of the church does not for, forbid that in conformity with the present state of human sciences and sacred theology, research and discussions on the part of men experienced in both fields take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution. In as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from preexistent and living matter. But the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. However, this must be done in such a way that the reasons for both opinions, that is those favorable and those unfavorable to evolution, be weighed and judged with the necessary seriousness, moderation and measure and provided that all are prepared to submit to the judgment of the church to whom Christ has given the mission of interpreting authentically the sacred scriptures and of defending the dogmas of faith. All right, so he's saying a couple of things here, right? First, he's saying, this is really a question not for, not for empirical science, but for faith, right? Because he said, ultimately, um, that any form of discussion that happens, they have to submit to the judgment of the church, right? As if this the church has um, sort of authority or at least, um, has the skill to, okay, you guys online can hear me okay, right? 
Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, so let's let's talk about what the the bounds of discussion were meant to be based on the encyclical. Okay. So he didn't say he didn't say uh, evolution. He said, but the origin of the human body alone. Um, and here's what he said: with regard to the doctrine of evolution, in as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body. Okay. Only evolution, in as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter. For the Catholic faith obliges us to hold the souls are immediately created by God. So if this really does belong to the church to answer this question, why does he allow for discussion? Why would he allow for discussion? Well, um, given earlier in the encyclical, he's not a big fan of evolution. In fact, he, he talks about uh, the fictitious tenets of evolution earlier. So there's three reasons why he might allow that, all right? Um, hang on one second, let me just see. Okay. Um, there's, so there's three reasons, right? All right, the first is that, um, that evolutionary research would yield that you would give you the answer to the true origin of matter, okay? Um, that he, he thought that science could lead the church to the truth in this area, all right? At least as regards to where the human body came from. Um, the second is that the church knows there's the church knows the truth, um, and science knows the truth, but they're not the same truth. All right, um, and so. Okay, so the the first uh, that evolutionary biology may yield the answer to the true origin of man. He answers in, in another place. He says, the multiple research, be it paleontology or biology or morphology on the problems concerning the origin of man have not as yes, yet ascertained anything with great clarity and certainty. Okay, that's still the case. Now, we must leave it to the future to answer the question, if indeed science will one day be able, enlightened and guided by revelation, to give certain and definitive results concerning a topic of such importance. All right, and so, is again, remember, keeping in mind the whole hierarchy of the sciences, he's saying this is a question, when we're talking about human origins, this is not a question that empirical science can answer directly, all right? It's pre, remember the, the, the slide from last time with um, Chesterton about it being prehistoric, right? All right, so I said the second was, the second possibility is that the church knows the truth, but science as a whole has its own truth, right? Um, and this is obviously a little more common than we'd like it to be. Um, and we've all heard the kind of the idea, I think we talked about it last week about truth. Contradict truth, and that's actually a, a dogma of the faith um, from the, the Fifth Lateran Council in 1513. Let me see if I can read this right. Ah, since truth cannot contradict with truth, we define that every statement contrary to enlightened truth of the faith is totally false and we strictly forbid teaching otherwise to be permitted. Okay, so there are no parallel truths, all right? If uh, the church says something is true, then empirical science ought to um, verify that, okay? All right, so what's the, the, the third, if the first two aren't possible? He thought that a discussion between the church and evolutionary biology would reveal the grave error in evolution, okay? Um, and so then that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. All right, so, so the first thing we have to do in order to do this is set up some principles of interpretation, all right? So, so what's at stake here, we talked about last time, was the, the first uh, three chapters of Genesis, really the first 11 chapters of Genesis, but we're just gonna focus on the first three tonight. Um, what are the church's principles of interpretation when it comes to, to that? So there's a few that are important, okay? Um, the first has to do with the church fathers as an authority. And this comes from uh, Leo the Thirteenth. Uh, in, in Providentimus Deus, uh, which he wrote in 1894, I think. Um, and uh, Pius XII actually quotes him. So it is permitted to no one to interpret Holy Scriptures against such sense or also against the unanimous agreement of the fathers. The Holy Fathers, we say, are of supreme authority whenever they all interpret in one and the same manner any text of the Bible as pertaining to the doctrine of faith or morals for their unanimity clearly evinces that such interpretation has come down from the apostles as a matter of Catholic faith. Okay, why is that true? 
Why does the church, why does the church look to the, the church fathers as an authority? And in fact, in, in many cases, an infallible authority, right? And this is the gift that, that you know, we as Catholics have that we don't always take advantage of, right? The reason why the church fathers are, are an authority is because when revelation is given, right? It has to be received, right? To be revelation, all right? And so when you wanna know what revelation means, you look to the people that received it, right? You look to the people who received it, which are the church fathers. So they, they know, for example, um, certain truths of the faith. Um, and the reason why they know them is because the apostles told them about them, right? And in the early church, and you can still find these today, there's a thing called a katena, which is just a chain where a saint would, or, or a father would come along and say, um, I declare that, uh, that Jesus is both God and man. And he'd say, and, and I got this from St. Augustine, who got this from St. Jerome, who got this from St. Cyril, who got this from St. Uh, Justin Martyr, who got this from St. Clement, who got it from the apostles, right? That's what they did. And you know, they, they would have these chains uh, written out of, of how and where they got uh, the, the different teachings that they had, right? And they may add to it. So they may make add to it in the sense of make something more explicit that's implicit in, in what's there. Um, but nevertheless, um, if you want to know what scripture means, you go to the people it was given to, right? Sort of like we do with the, with the founding fathers, right? Like if I want to sort of understand what Jefferson meant about something, I might read what he wrote in other places, or um, I might go to the people who knew him and what they said about it. Um, and so in that way, um, when the church fathers agree about something, the church says that, that that's a definitive teaching, okay? And so um, if we were to find, and we will tonight, um, certain uh, doctrines related to creation that the church fathers had um, unanimous agreement on, um, then we would say that those, those belong to uh, doctrines or even dogmas in some cases, okay? Um, so there's this notion of, of almost a passive infallibility in which um, an infallible teaching is received um, and then passed on, okay? Um, and then the, set, the second part um, uh, of the quote um, has to do with, um, are there any cases where if the fathers, um, you know, believe something, can we depart from it? And he says, and if for some, if reason dictates, uh, that you depart from it, uh, then, and you have good reason to do so, it may be permissible, okay? But again, not necessarily in a contradictory way, but in a way uh, that would um, either have doctrine grow um, or at least uh, be, more, be made more explicit, okay? Um, and so that's the second half of the quote, all right? And so when the fathers agree about something and they agree a lot about creation, um, I'm gonna talk about that tonight, um, we have to hold that, that, what, uh, that what they teach is true, okay? All right, so what about reading Genesis in, in, uh, specifically, okay? Um, so in uh, the early 1900s, um, there was um, Pope, uh, Pope Leo XIII formed what was called the Pontifical Biblical Commission, right? And it was a part of the Magisterium at the time. Right. In fact, in um, 1907, uh, Saint Pope St. Pius X um, issued a, a motto proprio, which is just essentially an official statement saying that, um, that everything that they published was to be considered as coming from the magisterium of the church. All right. And so one of the things that they dealt with was Genesis. Right. And so they have a couple of documents they issued on Genesis. Um, and we're going to come back to these in a, in a couple of a place and the nice thing about these normally when the church gives an answer it's not very uh clear um here there's a lot of clarity because they just say yes or no right? that's all that, that's the answer they give all right so um all right so this has to do with the literal interpretation of genesis all right um now before I, before we even get into what the church says i want you to think about this for a second all right because a lot of times we talk about how um genesis has um it's meant to be read in uh, like metaphorical language or it's a metaphor in and of itself, right? Now, first of all, metaphorical language is different from being actually a metaphor, all right? But let me ask you the question, if uh, you have an all-powerful God who creates, 
does he need metaphors to describe what he did? All right, like, can he just say how he did it? Like, can he do anything? So part of the way he does things is to make them intelligible to us, right? So if he says that he breathed life into Adam, that's probably not a metaphor, right? In some way, God breathed life into Adam, right? And maybe, maybe we, there's a little bit of anthropomorphizing there where um, you can almost imagine like God, like mouth to mouth with Adam. Um, but that's not a metaphor, right? That's, that's different than a metaphor, right? Or that's different than symbolic language, right? So, so, and again, this is not an argument, but this is just the fittingness of it. Um, and the reason why you always, you always start with the literal meaning of what you're reading. And so you have a good reason not to read it literally, right? Because God can use events as symbols. He doesn't need to use symbols for events, okay? He can use events as symbols because he's the, the, the maker of all, right? The second part, which is also really important, is the only time we use metaphors is to make something clearer. Okay, so let me ask you again the question about um, if God breathing into Adam is a metaphor, how does that make it any clearer than if God raised up Adam's body through evolution? All right, so, so that metaphor actually makes it unclear, right? Why would we use a metaphor for something that is, metaphors are always used to, to, to explain something more complicated than what uh, than what you're actually, uh, what actually happened, right? And so that's a way simpler explanation, right? It's way simpler explanation, okay? And then this is not an argument, but it begins to get us thinking about, well, wait a second, why would we throw away the literal meaning of scripture when, uh, when God doesn't need to use that? He doesn't need to use metaphors, okay? All right, so, so then let's sort of uh, talk about what they said, okay? So, um, the Pontifical Biblical Commission, notwithstanding the historical character and form of Genesis, the special connection of the first three chapters with one another and with the following chapters, the manifold testimonies of the scriptures, both of the Old and New Testament, the almost unanimous opinion of the Holy Fathers and traditional view, which the people of Israel also, ha also has handed on and the church has always held, may it be taught that the aforesaid three chapters of Genesis contain not accounts of actual events, that is uh, natural event accounts, that is, which correspond to objective reality and historical truth, but either fables derived from mythologies and cosmogenies. How many times have you heard that? It's just a fable or uh, derived from some, uh, some other myth of ancient peoples and accommodated by the sacred writer to monotheistic doctrine after the ex expurgation of any polytheistic error or allegories and symbols without any foundation in objective reality posed under the form of history to inculcate religious and philosophical truths or finally, legends in part historical and in part fictitious, truly composed with a view to instruction and edification. All right, so there was a lot there. So let me just sort of say what it's saying, right? So it's asking, can we believe that Genesis is any of these things? Can we believe that Genesis um, is part fictitious or um, that allegories and there, that it just uses allegories and symbols without any foundation in objective reality and so forth, All right? And the answer is no. All right, so they say in the negative, All right? So when you go to interpret Genesis, the first three chapters of Genesis, none of those interpretations can be correct. All right, if you only come away with that it's a myth um, or it uses, uh, you know, mythic language, um, then uh, to describe, um, you know, or, or an allegory or symbols, any, any of those things, all right? So it has to be, it has to, you have to start with it being a fact, a historical fact. All right, and now the description of it, remember we talked about it before, right? It's outside of our experience. And so we'd expect the language to be a little bit difficult, right? And, and the understanding to be a little bit difficult. But nevertheless, you can't ju just simply dismiss it. All right, so that's the second rule. All right, so we rely on the fathers and then um, the, the typical, um, and, and we actually, I think, hear that a lot today, right? You hear that, um, that explanation, all right? One more. Is it possible in particular call into question the literal and historical meaning where there is question of facts narrated in these same chapters that touch the foundation of Christian religion, such as among others, the creation of all things that was accomplished by God at the beginning of time, all right? The creation of all things by God at the beginning of time, uh, the special creation of man, the formation of the first woman from the first man, so Eve out of the side of Adam, um, the unity of the human race, so there's polygenism, 
the fall of the first parents from their primitive state of innocence and the promise of a future redeemer, right? Can any, any interpretation, any interpretation of scripture that fits into evolution do any of these things? And the answer is no, okay? Um, so anything connected with those foundational truths, all right? And, and we're gonna see tonight that if we accept evolution, uh, we begin to have to throw out a lot of, a lot of those truths, all right? And that's, that's why it deliberately picks those, um, those particular truths. All right, so there are, we're gonna talk about um, seven different Right, so seven doctrines are contained in the first three chapters of Genesis. Um, and, and we're going to talk about these from at least what, uh, at least sort of juxtapose them with the evolutionary understanding. And then remember what we're sort of getting at here um, is to show uh, not just why um, evolution is, is ultimately false, but also why theistic evolution doesn't work. Okay, about why that compromise doesn't work. All right, so, so the first is that God created everything uh, each thing immediately, right? Not everything, but each thing is probably a better way to put it. All right, and so the first Vatican Council said, if anyone does not confess that the world and all things which are contained in it, both spiritual and material, were produced according to their whole substance, out of nothing by God, or holds that God did not create by his, by his will free from all necessity, but as necessarily as he necessarily loves himself, or denies that the world was created for the glory of God, let him be anathema, right? Um, so, so what is this saying, okay? Um, it's saying that God created the whole being, all right? The whole creature in his essence, in his substance, right? And we talked about how immediately uh, e evolution presents a, presents a totally different paradigm for that, right? Because we said last week, really there's no natures, right? So evolutionary understanding, nothing has a nature, right? It was just sort of um, kind of a, a thinly veiled, what we call nominalism, right? Um, so, um, so then, then what the church teaches is that God made each thing, um, whole in its nature. Okay. Um, and so make sure we sort of understand the difference, right? So, so the first, it made, God made the first apple tree, for example, let's say apple tree is its own, its own species, right? And then leaves it to Providence and to the natural powers of, of apple trees to then generate more. All right, so that's not, we're not saying that God, that's, that's a Muslim belief that, that God creates each thing uh, individually, right? Um, he created the natures and then created indiv individuals of that, of that natural kind. And then from there, then they naturally generate, right? So, so when we talk about, we make this distinction between creation, which only God can do, um, and generation. Okay, um, so what about uh, how do we how do we answer um, things like okay let's let's talk about this for a second. So one of the one of the side effects of this right is that everything that God created has the appearance of age. All right, and what I mean by that is if you're going to make something out of nothing, then it's going to look like a mature a mature individual of that thing, right? So think of Adam, right? He doesn't make Adam as a little baby. He makes him as a grown man, right? When he makes trees, he makes the full-blown trees, right? When he makes the chickens, he makes regular chickens, right? So, so the chicken really did come before the egg. Um, and so a natural sort of effect of that is that things will appear to be older than they are, right? The way he made them, because he made them fully mature, okay? Um, that's just... You know, that's just the way it has to be if you're going to, to make um, things out of nothing, right? Um, so what does that mean? Um, well, it means that if, you know, a doctor were to go look at Adam, he'd think he was a 30-year-old man or something like that, right? Even though he was 30 minutes old, okay? Um, but it also could mean that something like the universe could be created in an old state. And what I mean by that is it could give the appearance that light, which may take millions of years to get from one, the light could already be here, right? Because when he created the thing, he created the light with it, all right? And so you could have 
uh, and, and actually science sort of confirms this because when they look through a telescope at, at galaxies far away, they can't understand why they don't look young, right? Why they look fully formed, even though they're, you know, millions of light years away. And that's because when God created the planet, he also created the light with it, okay? Um, and which is, again, some people will think, well, well, God was just tricking us, but not really, right? Because that, that is just the natural effect of, of the, the planet being grown at a, you know, a certain size, okay? Um, does, that, does that make sense? All right, and this is why, um, again, when we think in those terms, we can, uh, we can think about, well, in the beginning, God created the light, but then didn't create the sun until the fourth day. How does that work? Well, you know, light can exist without, without the sun, right? Um, and that light actually, and they've even, they've even found this now, right? With it, uh, once, a li once light has left its source, um, it's free and has an existence of its own, right? So God can create light um, and then the light is there. Um, it can, in, it, it can uh, exist independently, right? And so that was, I think, again, very, if you, if you sort of begin to read the, the Genesis account, you see how uh, it flips, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, flips the evolutionary account completely on its head, almost deliberately so, almost as if the guy who wrote it knew that at some point this would be the case, right? Because we have light before we have the sun, we have, you know, we have, it, it teaches the the animals backwards to how we think they evolved. Um, all right, so so creation, the, the take home of this before I get sort of too, ahead of, too far ahead of myself, um, is that God created um, and only God can, can create. Okay, so God created each thing immediately, right? He doesn't create in pieces, all right? Um, and so those, that automatically becomes a challenge to evolution, right? Um, because each new substance, each new uh, existence, um, each new kind of thing has to come from God. Whereas evolution says it can come from other kind, kinds of things. Okay. Um, and then God is said, again, they say here that like God is said to be completely free in, in um, creating and evolution says that there's a certain compulsion, right? Like it, it follows some certain law and it has to create this way. Okay. Um, and the other part, which we'll return to, is just the notion of, like, the world exists. Um, this is for God's glory, right? And if the world is created um, where nature is red in tooth and claw, right, where, where to create means to kill, like, how is that for God's glory? All right, and we'll come back to that. All right, so, so one of the things I, I want to just, and this is sort of just a side note, I want to talk about is... Um, the, the notion of, uh, we talked about how evolution struggles with the fact that it, you know, it's fundamental unit of species, but it doesn't have a really good definition for species, right? Um, what I want to do is relate this to the, um, the sort of philosophical understanding of species um, as just a, having to do with the nature, um, a, a natural kind, and then the idea that God created um, according to their kinds, all right? Um, now, immediately we say, okay, this doesn't work with evolution uh, because the different kinds um, are constantly changing, right? This, you know, God's creation says that there are fixed species, okay? Those, those things cannot, they're immutable. They can't change. They, uh, uh, you know, a cow can't become an elephant, right? Um, you know, a horse uh, can't become a human being, all right? It, it, it is what it is, what it is, right? But a ho could a horse become a zebra? Maybe, right? Um, so we, we get into these sort of places where um, those could actually be, have the same nature. They're just, they're, they're different in their accidents. And we'll talk about this next time we meet. Um, but just to sort of understand that, um, in the, when, the, when Genesis says that it was created according to its kind, um, it's just saying that God created and finished the creation of each thing individually, okay? Um, all right, and this is called, uh, often called special creation. And we'll come back and we'll use that term sometimes. All right, so, so first doctrine then was God created each thing immediately, okay? All right, what about God created the world in six days? All right, and this may be a little bit more controversial um, 
but hopefully by the time we get to the end of it, we can sort of begin to at least grasp uh, what this definitely doesn't mean and what it could mean, okay? Um, all right, so again, we go back to the Pontifical Biblical Commission, asking the question about the, the term yom, which is uh, Hebrew for day. In the designation and distinction of the six days mentioned in the first chapter of Genesis, may the word yom be taken either in the literal sense for the natural day or in an applied sense for a certain space of time. Or the key word is certain there. And may this question be the subject of free discussion among exegetes. And the answer to that question is yes. So could, could it be that six days are six 24-hour days? Or could it be that, uh, that the six days are some determinate or determined amount of time, all right? So, so notice what probably doesn't fit with this, that the days are somehow symbolic of these different epics that are millions and billions of years old, all right? Um, again, first, why would you use the term day for that? Um, it's not used for that specifically, but could it mean you know, some period of time, um, some sh shorter period of time, sure. Okay, um, but let's sort of lean towards it being uh, just six natural days, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. Okay, so in the old, in the Old Testament, that term yom is used uh, over nineteen hundred times, um, and it's used in the same sense we use it, right? So it could be used uh, to say something like, uh, well, to talk about a day, like today is. Tuesday, or it could say like in my day, like so this fixed period of time centering around my life. Okay. Um, so it's used 1900 times and always in those two contexts. All right. So we threw out the really long period of time. All right. Now, when, uh, when it has a number in front of it, or it talks about, um, it talks about morning and evening, like it does in the creation account. That's like 359 times, and it always refers to a single day, all right? And so the evidence points towards it being a single day, all right? All right, so not millions of years for sure. Could it be a lifetime of something? Yes. Could it be a, a single day? And that would be where we would lean, okay? And the reason why we lean that way, um, one, is because of the church fathers, which we're going to see in a minute. But also, I, I, I want to sort of talk about this for a second. Um, so what does evolution really just say? Okay, what is, uh, what is the theistic evolution really just saying? It's just saying God acted on the first day, right? Then the rest just sort of worked itself out, okay? So God created on one day, on the first day. Um, and then what does the account say happened on the sixth day or on the seventh day? God rested, right? Which means what? He stopped creating. All right, and so what does evolution say? Creation still going on, right? All right, so, so there it doesn't necessarily fit. Um, so evolution would have had to end on the sixth day if, if we could somehow fit evolution into this, into this, this story, all right? We're not, we're not dealing with the, the sort of materialistic, we're looking at it, if, can we make a compromise and have this theistic evolution? Um, all right, so, um, so let's talk about why uh, at least why we might lean towards it being an actual day of 24 hours. All right, so I, I mentioned that uh, several of the church fathers, um, in fact, there's almost universal agreement. One of the, the few that don't agree with this is St. Augustine, and they think that was because he had a, uh, a false translation of Sirach chapter 18, um, where he read that God had created everything, everything all at once. Every, like all of creation all at once, right? And so he thought, okay, well, how does he have seven, how does it break into seven days or six days? Well, the, the church fathers in general pretty much agree that the six days were six days, all right? And I have two here and you could Google and find many, many more. Um, and there was evening and morning one day. Why did he say one and not first? He said one because he was defining the measure of day and night since 24 hours fill up the interval of one day. All right, and that's St. Saint, Saint Basil. All right, so, what he's trying to, to say here is, okay, God created, right? He doesn't create in time, right? He creates with time, right? So time is one of the things that God creates, right? So does it even make sense? 
to go from the beginning and talk about uh, times unless like what is what is a million years when there's uh, no person who even understands or any notion of time all right so um, so in and of itself does it how do you measure a million years when the sun goes around the earth at different speeds right I mean that's one of the the, the ideas all right um, but the point here is is that, that God creates with time, not in time, all right? And just the same as God creates the natural laws, he doesn't create using the natural laws, right? So the natural laws are one of the things he creates in those six days, okay? And not surprisingly, this is why science bumps up to its limit, okay? Um, and similarly, uh, St. Ambrose says, scripture established a law that 24 hours, including both day and night, should be given the name of day only, as if one were to say the length of one day is 24 hours in extent, the nights in this reckoning are considered to be component parts of the days that are counted. Therefore, just as there is a single revolution of time, so there is but one day. Uh, there are many who call even a, a week one day because it returns to itself just as one day does and one might say seven times uh, revolves back on itself. All right, and so St. Ambrose is essentially um, saying that, uh, that the notion of day is actually established in scripture, all right? Let's talk about the the conflict, okay? So so whether we can squeeze evolution into uh, the six days of creation, all right? All right. So the, the the first issue we encounter is on the first day. The Earth was formed on the first day, before, not after the sun, moon, and the stars on the fourth day. All right. So so according to this, the sun ought to be older than those things, right? and we're told the exact opposite, right? Um, and even before the heavens are spread out. From the Earth on the second day, contrary to the Big Bang or any other theories of the formation of the universe, galaxies, and solar systems, which are produced in the opposite order and have the Earth and Moon formed to last. Okay, so, so again, if we're going to try to fit uh, those six days into an evolutionary worldview, we now have to sort of say, okay, well, the ordering itself is a metaphor, it doesn't tell us anything. All right, and then we find again, as if God saw it coming. What does he form on the fifth day? He forms the birds, right? And where do the birds come from according to evolution? The reptiles that were formed in the sixth day. All right, so again, we see it almost juxtaposed, right? Um, and then we see it again on the, on the, the fifth and sixth day again, right? Sea going uh, creatures formed on the fifth day um, and the land animals on the sixth day uh, from which they supposedly evolved, right? And so, so whales, which, allegedly it evolved from, from some sort of uh, land uh, mammals, um, then uh, are flipped. Um, all right. Um, all right, so, so uh, St. John Chrysostom talks about the, um, what is that? It kind of does sound like that. Yeah. That was a whole, that could have been a whole clip. Um, well, I mean, it kind of did sound like that though. Um, okay, um, sorry. Uh, so St. John Chrysostom talks about um, that God deliberately created uh, the sun on the fourth day so that you didn't think that the sun was the cause of the day, but instead of the way you measure it. Um, okay, so what about, uh, so let's at least try to tackle one of the objections. Um, and, and the first is, well, what about the two creation accounts? Like, how do, how do we fit those into, uh, or at least understand, right? And John Paul II did this in Theology of the Body, um, where he talks about the sort of objective um, in which we see the, the sort of order um, in this precise, gradual procedure of creation, where it's an orderly um, and, uh, and he calls that the objective, um, the objective way. He says, in the seven, seven day cycle of creation, a precise graduated procedure is evident. However, man is not created according to a natural succession. All right, so we're gonna come back to this when we talk about where man's body comes from, right? So, so the only time God stops in the creation account is almost as if he's deliberating about man, as if 
So, so again, if we're to read that, we say, okay, well, there was some kind of, there was some kind of change, right? Like something that stopped, God stopped and then created man. Okay. Um, uh, for calling him into existence as if he were pondering within himself to make a decision. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Um, and then he, he talks about, okay, well, what, what about the second creation account, which seems to have everything flipped around, right? Where, where man seems to come first. And he says, it can be said that it is a profundity, that it is of a nature particularly subjective, all right? So, so he's, now he's trying to explain creation from uh, the perspective of Adam, right? In the hopes that, that we learn something about our own nature, all right? It can be said that it is a profundity, that of a nature particularly subjective and therefore in a certain sense, psychological. The second chapter of Genesis constitutes in a certain manner, the most ancient description and record of man's self-knowledge. Together with the third chapter, it is the first testimony of human conscience, All right? Um, and so what it's, I mean, the first obvious thing is there's different ways to tell a story, right? This is what we see in the, the gospels, right? Orderly, like an orderly narrative isn't always the way it's done, right? And so there's a certain, um, certain way in which the second story is told um, that tells us something more specifically about Adam, okay? Um, and then we see, if we read it carefully enough, it isn't as if uh, God is, is somehow creating things um, in that account. What he's really doing is creating Eden, right? So if, if you read it, um, he forms man, then he forms Eden, and then he, he, then he creates trees in Eden, right? And he creates a river in Eden, and Adam's, and animals in Eden. Um, and so then we become, uh, we have a little difficulty again from an evolutionary perspective, um, figuring out where does Eden fit into that? Where does Eden fit into an evolutionary understanding? Okay. Um, all right, so that's the, the two creation accounts, right? And we can, we can talk more about those in the Q&A. All right, God created the first man immediately from the earth. All right, again, we're going to return, we're going to talk about um, this sort of what the church teaches, and then we'll talk about what this means and doesn't mean. Um, all right, and Pope Pelagius back in 680 said, I acknowledge that all men from Adam onward who have been born and have uh, died up to the end of the world will then rise again and stand before the judgment seat of Christ together with Adam himself and his wife, who were not born of other parents, who were created, one from the earth and the other from the side of, of the man. And then the, the Council of Cologne in 1860 said our first parents were formed immediately by God. Therefore, we declare that the opinion of those who do not fear to assert that this human being, man as regards his body, emerged finally from the spontaneous continuous change of imperfect nature to the more perfect is clearly opposed to sacred scripture and to the faith. All right, so, so this natural formation of Adam's body um, didn't happen, okay? Um, now, could there be... Uh, so it's not this long evolutionary change, um, and then suddenly there's a human body. And we'll talk about why that can't be when we, get, when we talk about philosophy. Um, but there isn't all, what, what, so that's, that's what's called natural transformism. Okay, so you'll see that term. And then there's the, the idea of special transformism, all right, which requires some sort of direct intervention by God. All right, uh, and not just the infusion of the soul, because the body has to be apt or made uh, for it to have a human soul, right? So the body would have to be changed in some way, right? And so either way, something miraculous had to happen for that, for that change, right? Um, and so that change, um, there's no reason why uh, God forming the, the man out of the dust of the earth and infusing the soul versus man, God taking the animal of some other living being, I mean, taking the body of some other living being changing that body so that it can have a human soul. And then that's the first Adam, okay? There's no reason why the, the dust of the earth is any less believable than the other thing, right? Um, and in fact, there's probably other, there's other problems with taking a living being, changing his body uh, so that it, it can now receive a human soul um, and then transforming it in, into something human, right? Um, and so if you're going to accept that, which is what a lot of people do accept, they're like, well, all of a sudden God just came along and infused the soul into this monkey, infused the human soul into the monkey. Um, if you're going to accept that, even though it's uh, 
sort of metaphysically impossible to do it that way. Um, there's no reason why you can say, okay, well, God just brought up dust from the earth. Why not just believe Genesis directly? Okay. Again, it's what happens is it's a compromise. Um, and then when we get, get to the, the metaphysics part, we talk about matter and form, we'll talk about why that can't, it can't be done like that. All right, uh, where did Eve come from? All right, and this becomes a dogma of the faith. All right, and, and this is sort of the, the biggest sort of blow to evolution, I think, from a Catholic standpoint. Leo the 13th is the cyclical on marriage. Paul Arcanum said, the true origin of marriage, venerable brothers, is well known to all. Though revilers of the Christian faith refuse to acknowledge the never interrupted doctrine of the church on the subject and have long striven to destroy the testimony of all nations of all times, they have nevertheless failed not only to quench the powerful light of truth, but even to lessen it. We record what is, what is to all known and cannot be doubted by any, that God on the sixth day of creation, having made man from the slime of the earth and having breathed into his face the breath of life, gave him a companion whom he miraculously took from the side of Adam when he was locked in sleep. God thus, in his most far-reaching foresight, declared that this uh, husband and wife should be the natural beginning of the human race from whom it would be propagated and preserved from an unfailing fruitfulness throughout all futurity of time. All right, so it is a uh, dogma of the faith that Eve has to come from the side of Adam, all right? Which, again, if you're going to believe anything, uh, I mean, evolution from that, that standpoint is really hard from when you somehow fit Adam and Eve together, the, um, the unbelievable improbability of one mutation occurring that, that creates Adam, another mutation created that creates Eve, um, and they just happen to be at the same exact time and place. Okay, the probability of that is pretty astronomical, no matter how long a time you're talking about, all right? So that would be the first thing, right? But even if we, and we talked a little bit about this last week, even if we accept that, right? Um, that creates all kinds of problems, right? Because one of the reasons why, um, why, why does God take Eve from Adam's rib? Why not his foot or his head, right? Brian can answer the question because she's done plenty of theology of the body, right? Because she is equal to him in dignity, right? And close to his heart. And so if there is no, if that didn't happen, there is no e equality and dignity between men and women, all right? One of them is, is evolutionarily higher than the other, right? Um, and we could sort of, again, get all the fallout from that. Uh, but if they, if they have the same origin, they literally came from the same place, right? Um, and one common nature, then they have to be equals, right? And so God knew what he was doing, right? And so evolution, at least from that standpoint, when it comes to the creation of man, especially the creation of Adam and Eve, um, doesn't work. It does not fit with the faith, okay? So let, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, oh, this is what I just said. Um, this is from St. Thomas, but um, Pope John Paul II talks a lot about this too. It was, the right, it was right for the woman to be made from the rib of man to signify the social union of man and woman. For the woman should neither use the authority over man, and so she was not made from his head, nor was it right for her to be subject to man's contempt as a slave, so she was made from his feet. Um, um, all right, but there's another reason why this is the case, all right? And this has to do with typology, right? So, so Old Testament types uh, point to New Testament realities. Um, and in a certain way, not only do they, are they, they foreshadowing of them, but they, they define them and complete them, right? So what do we believe? Uh, what do we believe about uh, Christ, who is the new Adam, what do we believe came from his side, from his rib, when his rib is pierced? His bride, the church, right? So that really, really happened. That's a fact, right? In fact, John makes it very clear in his gospel that he saw that and witnessed that, that particular thing, that piercing of the side, right? And then, again, John's gospel is very, uh, has, has that certain parallel to Genesis, right? He, he starts in the beginning and he has his, his sixth and seventh day of new creation, um, and the new Eve is introduced there, right? And so out of the side of Jesus, the new Adam, comes the, the bride, his bride, the church, right? Now, if the first Eve did not really come from the side of the Adam, 
then how do we know that the church really came from the side of Christ? All right. And so if the type didn't happen, right, you see this, a better example of this, right, is Jonah, right? Christ says, I, I won't give it, I will not give this generation a sign except the sign of Jonah. What's the sign of Jonah? Jonah was dead in the belly of a whale for three days, whereas Christ dead in the, in the belly of the earth for three days, right? And so if Jonah didn't really happen, or if Jonah is just a symbol, right, then Christ's death was just a symbol, okay? Um, and so the type has to, has to point ahead to the typology. And this is why ultimately um, the church is really careful about protecting the, the idea that Eve came from the side of Adam, All right? And so the Council of Vienna in 1312 said, and that in this assumed nature, the word of God willed the salvation of all, not only to be nailed to the cross and to die, but also having already, treat, already breathed forth his spirit to permit his side to be pierced by land so that from the outflowing of water and blood, there might be formed the one immaculate and holy virginal mother of church, the bride of Christ, as from the side of the first man and, and uh, his sleep, Eve was fashioned as his wife. Okay. All right, so God created the first woman immediately from the body of the first man. And now we move, God created the first man and, and woman in a state of happiness and innocence. Um, we won't spend too much time on this one. Um, as I already kind of mentioned, uh, at least from evolution, how uh, Eden creates some problems. Um, Council of Florence, most firmly it believes, professes, and preaches that the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the creator of all things that are visible and invisible, who when he willed it made from his own goodness all creatures, both spiritual and corporeal, good indeed because they are made by the supreme good, but mutable because they are made from nothing. And it asserts that there is no nature of evil because every nature insofar as it is a nature is good. All right, so what does this have to do with with evolution. All right, so what if we accept, and I sort of hinted at this already, what if we accept, so God creates all things good, right? He sees it on the sixth day, and, he, and he, at the end, he says, it, it's good, this is very good, right? Um, but this is vastly different, right, from he sees, he sees all of creation, everything he created. This is vastly different from saying that, that each thing that is created is destroyed so that something else could become about, okay, which is what evolution essentially says, right? Essentially says, okay, trial of fittest says that in order for the species to advance, things must die, all right? And so it's, it's, it's again, sort of almost flipping uh, creation on its head uh, in saying that rather than it being life-giving, it, be, it has to be death dealing, right? So everything comes from death. Um, and then, um, which we already talked about, we already talked about the that the, um, the problem of the Garden of Eden. Um, but the other issue is how do we, how does an unfallen man, an unfallen woman, how do they fit into evolution, right? It sort of gets us moving towards our next point about original sin. Um, and this is one of the reasons why um, the church is really, um, really protective of uh, the creation account. Because, well, that seems a little morbid, right? That we really care about original sin, but no original sin, guess what we don't have? No Christ, right? Um, no, no fall, no redeemer. No old Adam, no new Adam. So the first man and woman sinned and lost the state of original happiness and innocence, all right? This is just um, original sin. And so from Romans uh, chapter eight, um, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. All right, so what does, uh, what does an evolutionary worldview say is that the world um, is in constant decay. By nature, it decays, right? Um, so, uh, so this idea then that... Um, that there must be, uh, again, there must be things dying, but how do we then, how do we then reconcile that um, where, uh, where, there, where in the beginning, the world wasn't like that? How do, how do we reconcile that? How does that fit into an evolutionary worldview? Um, and so St. John Chrysostom says, Paul means by this, 
that creation became corruptible. So it wasn't always corruptible, which again is what evolution says. It became corruptible and became corruptible because man sinned. Why and for what reason? Because of you, O man. For because you have a body which has become mortal and subject to suffering, the earth too has received a curse and has brought about thorns and thistles. The creation suffered badly because of you and it became corruptible. Right? And so the fall, falling from such a height, Adam damaged the earth too, okay? All right, the last is, uh, has to do with polygenism. The whole human species dis descended from the first man and woman. And now we turn back to where we started with um, Pope Pius XII, um, Humani Generis. Um, and this is the following paragraph that the first one I read, where he said that certainly there could be discussion about uh, where the human body came from. He says, when, however, there is a question of another conjectural opinion, namely polygenism, the children of the church by no means enjoy such liberty, but the faithful cannot embrace that opinion, which maintains that either after Adam there existed on this earth, true men who did not take their, their origin through natural generation from him as from the parents of all, or that Adam represents a certain number of first parents. Now it is in no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with, with that which the sources of revealed truth and the documents of the teaching authority of the church propose with regards to original sin which proceeds from a sin actually committed by an individual Adam and in which the generation is passed on to all and is in everyone as its own. Okay, so polygenism just simply means there's multiple first parents, all right, which means there would be multiple sort of races of, of people, okay? The problem with that is that there is, um, if not everyone uh, comes from Adam, then not all people sinned in Adam. So there could be an unfallen race at any given time, right? So there could have been um, a race that was totally independent of Adam that didn't sin, right? And you think about like C.S. Lewis has in one of his space trilogies, right? He has this unfallen race on another planet, right? All right, so that, that then become, okay, and they could have had an offspring, right? Who also was unfallen, okay? Now, you see how you begin to now pull away certain, certain uh, aspects of the faith. Who is the only, who is the only one the church ha says has that singular grace to have been conceived without original sin? Mary, right? So, so immediately you go, okay, well, wait a second. If there's multiple races and there could have been, uh, there could have been multiple, there could have been multiple children born without sin. Well, now we have to throw out the American conception okay? because she's not really all that unique. All right. And so that's, again, one of the reasons why polygenism is wrong. Um, and then, uh, okay, so, so then you have a whole, you have a person who maybe doesn't need a redeemer, right? And so now no longer in Adam, they're no longer in Christ. Um, what about though, and this becomes one of those, um, one of those objections people often have. Okay, so, so fine, there's just Adam and Eve. Where did their grandchildren come from? All right, that's usually the, the, the common question, right? Like where, where if, you know, where did their grandchildren come from? Um, because people say, okay, well, um, you know, Cain and Abel and Seth, they, there are no outsiders for them to marry. Right? So, so how did they have children? Um, all right, and so usually the way to talk about this is begin to think about um, why is incest wrong? It's wrong because God said so, right? So, so St. Thomas says incest is actually not part of the natural law, all right? There's nothing uh, in nature itself uh, that, or, or in our nature itself that says a man can't marry his sister, okay? Now it's repugnant to us because we're used to that, right? We're used to that idea, right? We're used to the idea that a man should never marry his sister, right? And, and in the case, like John Paul II actually talks about this, he talks about how um, one of the reasons why, and, and he's building on what Augustine said, he said, well, one of the reasons why a man shouldn't marry his sister is because he lives in a house with her and he's lusting after her already, right, from the very get-go. Um, and so God, after Noah, after the flood, gives a positive commandment not, uh, that incest is wrong, okay? Um, up to that point, um, that's where their grandchildren came from, right, where Adam and Eve's sons uh, marry their daughters, all right? And 
often like when I ask the question, okay, what makes it wrong? People will say, well, the child will come out all messed up, right? That's a consequence of it, not actually why it's wrong, right? It's wrong because God said so. Um, which is kind of strange that, you know, it's one of those things where, um, where th that's the only, only place we find that it's wrong, right? It's like, because God said so. Um, and people still believe it. Um, so, um, so Adam and Eve would have been, if you sort of look at it genetically, right? They would have been in, uh, genetically identical, right? Because Eve came from his side, right? And so they would have been like fraternal twins, right? And so in a certain sense, their offspring too would be um, coming from, from these gene, perfect human genes, right? Um, and we would say, okay, well, in the fall, um, there's no reason to think that uh, Adam and Eve's genes actually changed, right? And so we could say, okay, well, their offspring, what would happen with their offspring? Well, their offspring could have a mutation, a genetic mutation in it as a result of the fall, right? Um, and, but the chances of them uh, having a mutation in their sister having the same random mutation and then passing it on to their offspring would be tiny, right? And so you wouldn't expect the next child to have something wrong with them. Um, but, uh, but it's only when, you know, a sufficient number of mutations appear, right, that you begin to see problems, right? And this is why at a certain point, God, um, God's with Noah says, okay, no, uh, you can't marry your sister anymore. Um, and he says that St. Saint, Saint Thomas says, um, hence by natural law, father and mother are, are debarred from marrying their children. All right, so why is that? Why is it not okay for father and mother to marry their children. It's because there's a relationship already of superiority and inferiority, right? Um, uh, and the mother still more than the father since it is more derogatory to, rev to the reverence due to parents if a son marry his mother than if a, mother, if a father marry his daughter since the wife should be to a certain extent subject to her husband, the proof of which it was said in Genesis, wherefore a man shall leave father and mother, which cannot be understood of cohabitation and consequently must refer to the union of marriage. All right, and so the precept, um, the next generation of children simply just comes from um, Adam and Eve's children marrying. Okay. All right, questions? Yes.